National Maritime Union is 10 years old. It is the largest single union of seamen in the world. It is the strongest, most democratic rank and file union. It is founded on democratic principles, guaranteeing as it does under its constitution, equality for all. In the constitution, the rights of every member are stated. The constitution guarantees no discrimination because of race, creed, color or political affiliation. It guarantees rotary shipping to all its members. It guarantees secret referendum votes on the election of officers and provides for swift suspension and recall of any officer who is incapable of doing his work or in any other way betrays the trust lodged in him by the membership. The Constitution provides for close scrutiny of all finances. It provides for conventions of the most democratic character with delegates from every ship under contract meeting once every two years to formulate the basic policies and programs of the Union. All major policies are submitted to secret referendum votes. As a result, power is lodged where it belongs, in the hands of the membership. And the Union maintains eternal vigilance to prevent this power from being weakened in any way. Since May 1937, when the seamen left the old corrupt International Seamen's Union of America, the National Maritime Union has achieved tremendous gains for its members and has been the pace setter in the industry. Wages have been raised from as low as $30 a month to where today the average is $200 a month. The work week has been reduced to 48 hours at sea, with overtime Sunday and 40 hours in port, with overtime for Saturday and Sunday. Living conditions have been changed on most ships. The old foxels, with many men, have been changed to modern, well-ventilated, comfortably equipped rooms. To achieve greater gains, to which the seamen are justly entitled, there is still much work to be done. And one of the principal methods by which greater gains can be achieved is through working unity with all the other legitimate maritime unions. The NMU has a fighting program it sums up to, one, 40 hour a week at sea and in port. Two, guaranteed annual wage. Three, increased manning scale of all departments. Four, wage increases to take up the slack of rising prices and to still further improve our living standards. Five, extended vacations with pay. This program, in my opinion, can be achieved. It can be brought about much faster, however, if united action can be developed among all the unions. How then can united action be developed? First, the NMU will develop meetings between the unions, namely the National Maritime Union, the SIUSUP, the MFOW, the ACA, the ROU, the MMP, the MEPA, the ILA and the ILWU. At these meetings, the NMU will submit ideas and programs that we believe all the unions can support. These programs, like the one I have just talked about, are conditions which all seamen want and which all the unions can support. It is true there are differences between the unions in ideas, in policies, and in methods. But surely, there can be no differences on issues that are plainly of benefit to every seaman that sails the ships. Out of such meetings, there can be developed programs of action designed to bring about the greatest gains for all maritime workers. The NMU will not claim that its program is the only one. We recognize that unity is achieved only on the basis of recognition and respect for the ideas and suggestions of others. It would not be good for us to jam our ideas and suggestions down the throats of others. The best method is to pool our ideas and our programs and work out the best possible program of action. There are other important questions facing the union and the industry, and in fact, the entire labor movement in America. On the political front, the labor movement is fighting for its very life. The most reactionary Congress in our history has passed a law that aims to crush all unions, wipe out gains, and place the yoke of slavery on all the working people of America. Unity of action in the face of this law must take place between the AFL and CIO. It will take place 
if the rank and file of all the unions unite and fight to wipe out this first step towards fascism. Thus, all of us in the maritime industry must work to develop unity between all the unions in our industry. This, I believe, is how it can be done. Unity cannot be achieved by phony affiliations or by paper organization. Unity can be achieved by the unions working together, first on small questions, and later working together on the bigger problems, by a mutual respect between unions for each other, by a willingness on the part of all the unions to make some concessions on behalf of all the seamen, by remembering that the officials of these various unions have been elected by the membership and enjoy the respect and confidence of the membership. But the main program of unity and common action must be carried out by the rank and file of all the unions. This was proved in September 1946 when the membership of every maritime union respected and supported the picket lines of others. This was working unity in action and the membership of the NMU can develop more of this by going aboard the vessels in foreign ports that are under contract to the other maritime unions and discussing with these seamen the need for common action by developing sentiments for close fraternity based on mutual confidence and trust. In this way, the membership of the maritime unions can break down any antagonisms that may exist. Unity on all issues is now a burning necessity. As a result of united action, the dream of all maritime workers can and will take place. The building of one powerful national organization, having within its ranks all the maritime workers. modern life is bound up with sea trade. The Industrial Revolution, the drive toward empire and markets, the foundation of these past events and the foundation of today's capitalism was the first ocean-going ships and the men who sailed them. The men who sailed the ships commanded by Columbus, Drake, Magellan, and John Smith. The world changes. The old romantic sailing ships have disappeared from the sea. And in their place are huge machine-driven ships, as vast and as intricate as a modern factory. The ships have grown and changed, and the men have grown and changed. Together, they have changed the world. The ships are like floating factories manufacturing transportation. The men, the seamen, longshoremen, harbor workers, are a leading sector of the industrial working class. But ships are still ships, and unlike shoreside factories, they sail the seven seas. And unlike shoreside workers, seamen don't leave their factories when the day's work is done. Imagine working in a factory, and then when you're finished with the day, eating in that factory, and then going to bed in that factory. Imagine making a factory your home, where any time, day or night, the boss can stick his head in your door and order you out on deck to work. Try it for a month or so, and then you'll begin to understand some of the romance of the sea. Men like these sailors on deck and their buddies down in the engine room, and the men of the steward's department, these men and their officers kept the ships of democracy sailing through five years of submarine-infested waters. For five years, the seven seas were a watery no-man's land. For five years, the seamen faced the full fury of the fascist gangsters, the strafing, the bombs, the torpedoes. But the seamen could take it. Bombed and torpedoed seamen shipped out again and again. They kept them sailing until victory. 6,000 seamen were killed in the war. 
but you can't live on metals. Ships like this were the lifeline of the war. Built by the taxpayers' money, they were operated by private ship owners. The taxpayers paid money, the seamen paid in blood, and the ship owners reaped the profits. The ship owners took no risk during the war. The risks were taken by the seamen who manned their vessels. The ship owners were amply protected by government insurance. By the end of the war, 570 American merchant vessels were lost due to enemy action. The seamen were given watery graves. The owners collected insurance from the government. The longshoremen load the ships. Coffee Ann may mean donuts to most workers. To longshoremen it means... The longshoremen's coffee is served to them on 1,280-pound sling loads. And when you're finished with this one, why, there's always another one waiting. Foodstuffs, clothing, medical supplies, medicines, raw materials. In fact, anything of material value is handled daily by longshoremen working cargo. They load the ships with products coming from the length and breadth of America. Huge crates, boxes, packages and bags from Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, Hoboken, bound for Cape Town, La Arbe, Liverpool, Buenos Aires, Java, Shanghai, everywhere that ships can go, everywhere that people buy or trade. Then when the ships come back, there's the longshoremen who unload the world's riches to be transported to every nook and cranny in America. The longshoremen's work is hard. Whether he works down on the dock, on deck, by the winches, or deep down in the hole of the ship, his work is hard and back-breaking. Longshoreman's work is dangerous, too. A slight mistake, a cargo whip breaks and a thousand pounds of cargo go hurtling down into the hole. Today, the marine workers are a leading sector of American labor movement. The seamen, the officers on deck and below, mate and engineer, radio operator licensed by the government, responsible for millions of dollars worth of property and lives of the crew and passengers. Who scrapes the rust, paints the mask, and repairs the blocks and stays? Why, the sailor. Who tends the engines and runs the ship? The engine department. And who are the most talked about guys on ship? Why, the steward's department. The guys who prepare the meals and feed the crew. The longshoreman works the winches, loads the ships, and stows the cargo. The harbor workers service the harbor, carry cargo inland, help in the unloading of ships and run the ferries. The tugboat workers ride herd on a giant ocean-going ships, guide them safely into port. And then when they're resting alongside the dock, turn to chip, scrape, and paint. Yes, the marine workers are an important part of American labor. United, they are a great force for progress. United, the marine workers are a giant of American labor. United, they strike great blow for wages and conditions. Great blows for the future. The future that maritime workers have coming to them. The future that all workers have coming to them. Seafaring men have long fought for unity of all marine workers. The fight began a long time back. Now this hero stuff isn't new to seamen. They have been heroes before. In the First World War, they were heroes too. Sure, here they are, heroes. A grateful nation thanked them, then promptly forgot them. Heroes yesterday and bums today. Then after the war, the sellout. In 1921, the ship owners provoked a strike. They were out to destroy the Siemens Union. 
but the seamen fought back. But they were betrayed by their own leaders. See this character? He's got a date with a ship owner. That's a phony, a ship owner's agent, a labor faker. He doesn't want anybody to recognize him. He's running in to make a deal with the ship owners. A deal to sell the strike down the river. The ship owners were powerful. Their long fingers reached into the political machines, into Congress, even into the White House, even into the seamen's own union. The strike was broken. Conditions became worse. Ships were laid up. No jobs. Do you ever see 50 mates, bosuns, and ABs fighting for an ordinary seaman's job? Oh, that's a hell of a sight to see. Things will get worse if we let them. Things will get better if we make them better. Immediately following the strike, wages fell. In some cases, as low as $35 a month for ABs. Hundreds of ships were laid up. Business was at a standstill. The ship owners even went so far as to invite seamen aboard ship to work away at wages at one cent per month. Because the going was so tough, many seamen had to accept this offer. Then when they got aboard, they were given rotten food, a filthy place to sleep, and were promised the first paying job. Things will get better if we make them better. If we make them better, fellow worker. Yeah? What the hell can I do? I've been on the beach now for four months. Been getting my coffee and donuts. Yeah, been getting my coffee and donuts praying in the mission. Doing my sleeping. Doing my sleeping on park benches. What the hell can I do? Grim boarding house. Got ten bucks in my pocket. Been gone hungry for two months now. But I wouldn't touch that ten bucks. It was my last chance for a job. Last time I said I wouldn't go to a crimp. Said I'd go to hell first. Well, what the hell? You gotta work, don't you? You gotta eat, don't you? Now you gotta stay in the crimp joint. You'll eat. You'll sleep. And then they'll ship you out. And when you come back, you pay off the crimp, you go on the bum again. Shipping crimps worked both ways. They got paid by the companies for shipping seamen, and in many cases, the seamen would pay for jobs. Often more money was passed out by the seamen than they could earn back. But they got a place to sleep and three meals a day, as lousy as they were. Any complaints or beef raised by the seamen meant getting blackballed. Even the United States Shipping Board, established by the government, had their own private shipping crimps, run by the men who manned the shipping bureau. The seamen were hungry, and they were bitter. But worst of all, they were beaten and licked. The broken strike took a lot out of them. But no matter how tough the going gets, there are always guys with guts to fight. That's right, brother. Hand out those leaflets. See to it they're red, too. Fight. Fight to abolish the ship owner's vicious hiring system. The shape-up. Worker pitted against worker. The shape-up. A nightmare of intimidation and insecurity. Read it, fellow worker. Read it. Read it and learn. Read it and fight. Things will get worse if we let them. Things will get better if we make them better. In the early 30s, militant seamen organized the Marine Workers Industrial Union. Of course, the ship owners didn't call it that. They just called it the Red Union. Why? Well, take a look at that program. Better wages and conditions. Unity of all Marine workers. Lots of subversive stuff there. Un American, too. Sure, sailor. Take it aboard ship. A guy on ship has time to read. Time to think things out. 
But in those days, there are lots of rats and informers aboard ship. If you wanted to have a little meeting and talk a little union with some of your shipmates, you had to find some place where the stooges wouldn't come snooping around. Down in the forepeak in the rope blocker was a good place, provided the guy on the bow lookout would warn you if some pony came prowling around. It took men to do the tough, hard job of organizing in those days. Men such as this one, telling the boys the score about industrial unionism. Seamen and longshoremen need a union that fights for them. A union that doesn't divide the worker by playing one against the other on the basis of craft or color or religion or political beliefs. A union that is run by the seamen and the longshoremen themselves. The battle of freedom, freedom, freedom. As a union fights the battle of freedom, and the boss comes a tumbling down. The big struggles were just ahead. At midnight, May 1st, 1934, Negro longshoremen in New Orleans stood up strong and solid. They went on strike. In a week, the West Coast shoremen went out. A great general marine strike was on. Longshoremen, seamen, mates, skippers, teamsters, everybody out. Craft lines broke down. A powerful united front of seamen and longshoremen were hammered out. The ship owners used the strong arm of the government and called out the militia. Our answer, the marine workers said, must be a general strike of all workers. It was a tough and a long fight. And a lot of good guys got killed and never tasted the fruit of their struggle. Yes, it was a tough strike. On July 5th, the day after Independence Day, the day after the day we celebrate the rights of liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness, the day after the day became Bloody Thursday, the Battle of Rincon Hill. Cops threw in everything they had that day. Riot cars, bombs. Their rifle threw burning lead into the strikers. And when it was over, the streets ran red with blood, with the blood of the workers. Two were killed. We must never forget them. They died for us. The Marine Federation of the Pacific was born. Its symbol, two hands clasped. Its slogan, an injury to one, is an injury to all. The great marine strike gave impetus to industrial labor organizing in America. On the west coast, a beginning was made, but the fight for unity was far from won. Down in the Gulf, the ship owners pitted worker against worker, Negro against white, and on the east coast, the ship owners, aided by the corrupt union officials, kept the workers split. Divide and rule was the practice, and on the lakes and down on the river, the story was the same, no unity. But the seamen were on the march. They had learned to plenty and they were moving fast. The Marine Workers Industrial Union proposed a merger with the ISU. Forward to Marine Federation on the Eastern Gulf. But the ISU officials turned down the proposal. We don't want to work with Reds, they said. Maybe the rank and filer said they only want to work with the ship owners. What about the rank and file? Do they have the red horrors? Well, I'll tell you, bud. The only kind of horrors I've got is those pork chop horrors. Then to hell with phony officials. On March 20th, 1936, the California crew led by Joe Curran went on strike for West Coast wages and a union hiring hall. The strike struck a powerful blow for overtime and democratic hiring. The seamen went back to the ships to prepare for the next one. The marine firemen kicked out the old scab herding officials. The ship owners began arming for war in the marine unions. They hired thugs, gunmen, and large quantities of guns and ammunition. When the zero hour approached, the seamen were united and determined to defend their gains. In Italy, the Siemens Union had been crushed by fascist terror. The rank-and-file unions of German seamen were crushed by the Nazis. The seamen of America clenched their fists and swore they would not let it happen here. After long maneuvering, the second great waterfront strike began on October 30th, 1936. 
the waterfront was at a standstill. A patrol was established by the workers to prevent violence. The San Francisco waterfront was never as obedient of law and order as when the workers themselves guarded the front. Then the strike became national. With the start of the fifth week, the strike called on the West Coast spread to national proportions. Scenes such as this swept the ports of America as a seaman marched down the gangway's suitcase parade to hit the bricks for better hours, better wages, better conditions. The grim fight on the waterfront took on a sharper intensity. The greatest picket line in marine history drove forward. The strike stepped up to even faster tempo. The sailors and stewards kicked out their phony officials. The birth of industrial unionism in the marine industry was a bloody one. Then the biggest battle since the beginning of the strike began with the Seamen's March on Washington. After months of bitter struggle and vigorous political action, the Seamen broke the back of the strike-breaking Copeland Pink Book Law. Finally, the strike ended. After 99 days of solidarity and organization on the part of the Marine workers, the strike ended in victory. The Seamen, the Longshoremen, one great game. We're gonna roll, we're gonna roll. The mighty fist of unity smashed through the ship owners and marine workers' unions. Out of those early struggles came a new kind of union, a rank and file union, the National Maritime Union of America. Democratic shipping was established through the rotary hiring system. The first man registered is the first man to ship. Graft and favoritism were eliminated. Companies were prevented from forcing seamen to compete for jobs at lower wages. Rotary shipping cornerstone of a democratic seafaring union. Real rank and file democracy was established. The word democracy took on a real meaning. It began to live and breathe. It took on flesh and blood. Of course, the ship owners tried every means possible to destroy democratic unionism. Spying and disrupting goons and gangsters. But the rank and file tightened their ranks and were able to withstand them all. possible for the seamen. Better wages, better working and living conditions made it possible for a seaman to marry, have a family, make a home. Before the union, marriage and a family were an economic impossibility for the seamen. The seamen marched forward. They were second-class citizens, but now they fought to be first-class citizens. But the ship owners are the strong arm men of big business. The ship owners are still trying to kick the waterfront unions around. And the fight against the ship owners goes on. This is the man, Joe Saylor. This is the man John Shipowner is out to get. The little security that he has the dignity he has fought and won for himself. These things John Shipowner would destroy in his drive to return the nation to the rotten good old days of the open shop. This is the man John Shipowner's thugs in Congress are aiming their torpedoes at. Did he dodge Hitler's torpedoes in order to be torpedoed at home? This is the man. 
multiply him, his needs, his hopes and aspirations. And you have not one man, but many men, the maritime workers. The sum total of this multiplication is unity. The fight for unity has come a long way. The wage struggle in June and September 1946 mark a new level of unity. But the fight for maritime unity is far from won. But it will be won. The fight for unity will be won. Joe Sailor goes forward. He may stumble a little. He may even be forced back a bit, but not all the ways. John Sailor is marching forward, and the fight for maritime unity will be won, because it must be won. For the only guarantee of a decent future of all people is the unity of all labor. Thank <laughs> you.